All right. Well, I do want to talk a little bit about the politics of personal responsibility. Yes. Um, it's something that we should all have at least in the back of our minds as we see all of these uh, uh, coronavirus relief debates taking place and like what the underlying message is uh, to the American people from these United States lawmakers. Uh, so let's get into it. Let's get after it, as uh, Chris Cuomo would say. So. There's a lot of grief within the GOP over whether traditional conservatives like Representative Liz Cheney or Senator Mitch McConnell can cut out what they naively think is the temporary strain or stain of the Trump administration. But voters within the Republican Party clearly disagree with them. They love Trump so much that he's actually considering running for president again in 2024. But who knows? Who knows, I may even decide to beat them for a third time, okay? Beat them for a third time. Now, Trump doesn't plan on uh, forming a third party. In fact, he noted so much during that same speech. But if he decided to, recent polling shows that nearly half of Republican voters would literally leave the party to join one that's led by Donald Trump. Uh, in this uh, Sioux Folk University USA Today poll of Trump voters, 46% say they ditched the GOP for another if the twice impeached Trump were at the helm. Now, more traditional conservatives like Senator Mitt Romney might be critical of Donald Trump. He might even vote in favor of impeaching Donald Trump. However, he can't deny Trump's popularity. And uh, you're about to hear a very defeated sounding Mitt Romney in this next clip. Uh, and so there's a populist movement on the right in our country and on the left. And those movements, I don't believe, are going to be going away anytime soon. Although I think over time uh, that policies that, that endure and that really help the American family will be more successful. So I remain, if you will, a more traditional conservative than, than some of the populist uh, rhetoric within my party. Will, will President Trump continue to play a role in my party? I, I'm sure he will. He, he has by far the largest voice and a big impact in my party. I don't know about his family members, whether they intend to do that, but, but I expect he will continue playing a role. I don't know if he'll run in 2024 or not, but if he does, uh, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure he will win the nomination. Romney's absolutely right. I think he's absolutely right about that. And I think it's worth understanding what made Trump, or at least a big part of what made Trump so popular among the Republican electorate and why that popularity has lasting power. Trump was a departure from the Republican branding of personal responsibility. That talking point has been used incessantly, not just by Republican lawmakers, but also Democratic lawmakers as well. Americans had grown so accustomed to politicians shifting the blame onto workers who had lost their jobs as manufacturing plants shut down and companies downsized. Uh, the absence of strong labor unions also allowed for this practice to grow, as Barbara Ehrenreich notes in her book, book, Bright Sided, which I recommend reading. She writes this, that on the eve of the Great Depression, in the highly politicized 1920s, there had been plenty of labor organizers and radical activists around to rail about the excesses of the rich and the misery of the poor. In the 21st century, a very different and more numerous breed of ideologues promulgated the opposite message, that all was well in our deeply unequal society, for those willing to make the effort, it was all about to get much, much better. But Trump actually flipped the script in 2016, and The Atlantic perfectly explained how he did it. Uh, they write that Trump speaks less about personal responsibility than any Republican presidential nominee since Reagan. Trump blames multinational corporations more than any Republican nominee ever has. And uh, the piece just goes into more detail about how uh, Trump went with this messaging and really ran with it. Under Reagan, for instance, Republicans demanded personal responsibility from African-Americans and ignored the same cultural problems when displayed by whites. Under Trump, Republicans acknowledged that whites exhibit those same pathologies. Trump, for instance, uh, spoke frequently during the campaign about drug addiction in white rural states like New Hampshire. But instead of demanding 
taking personal responsibility trumps GOP promises state protection. Now, Trump was smart enough to latch onto a popular message that Romney was too slow to realize. And before I start getting the angry uh, direct messages, let me just say, obviously, Trump didn't deliver on these promises. Obviously, Trump was just paying lip service. He didn't actually carry out any of the policies that he claimed he would to protect workers. However, Mitt Romney uh, didn't even care to acknowledge these issues. And in fact, he went out of his way to really demonize people who were looking from help from the government. So four years before Trump clinched the 2016 GOP nomination, Romney bungled his own presidential bid by defaming 47% of the country as moochers during a speech in front of his wealthy donors. Here's a piece of that. There are 47% of the people who vote for the president no matter what. All right, there are 47% who are with him, who are dependent upon government, who believe that, that they are victims, who believe the government has a responsibility to care for them, who believe that they are entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. But that's, that's an entitlement, and the government should give it to them. And they will vote for this president no matter what. Now, that video led to a lot of backlash against uh, presidential candidate Mitt Romney. And uh, the Trump administration clearly had that in their back pocket to use for when Romney got out of line. And to be sure, Romney was one of the few Republicans who was willing to criticize Trump. And one of the times he did that led to this from Kayleigh McEnany. People across the country recognize that while Mitt Romney has a lot of words, notably he said that 47 percent of the nation is dependent upon government, believes they are victims, believes that the government has a responsibility to care for them. Those were Mitt Romney's words not too long ago. The president takes great offense to those words. The important takeaway here is that People in this country have been suffering from the rigged economic system. They've been suffering from growing inequality. They've been suffering from their jobs being shipped abroad. It's been difficult. And the only messaging that the American people have gotten, workers have gotten from government, has been to pull yourself up by the bootstraps. It's not the system's fault. It's your fault. Trump realized how sick people were of hearing that. And he decided to exploit uh, the absolute frustration that people are feeling in order to further his own political ambitions. Now, it's worth talking about the politics of personal responsibility. Personal responsibility in the American political context is all about shifting the blame of failing systems onto the people. There was a great discussion about this during a segment um, on The Jacobin Show. I want to share a piece of that with you because it just gives you some of the details you need to kind of understand what's been going on in this country. Take a look. So over the last generation, there's been this massive shift of economic risk from the broad shoulders of government and corporations onto the fragile backs of American families. And the, the result is that Americans are more and more worried about the American dream, about the idea that if you work hard, you'll be able to get ahead. It's not that the U.S. doesn't spend on benefits. If you combine public benefit systems with these mini welfare employee employer funded benefit systems, we spend as much as other rich nations like Sweden on a similar package of benefits, but with very, very different results. The degradation of these mini welfare states is what Jacob Hacker has termed the great risk shift. Rather than companies or the state shouldering the burden of risk, risk has been privatized with individuals and families having to personally manage and mitigate economic crises with no safety net. And every American is familiar with the disastrous results. Ariel is absolutely right about that. And uh, we do see it play out everywhere in politics. In fact, uh, I have a recent example featuring a Republican senator, Roger Marshall, who recently argued that workers don't need a federal $15 an hour minimum wage because, you know, I mean, when he went to college like a million years ago, he was able to work part time with a minimum wage job and do amazing things. Watch. I worked with about 15 other high school classmates through high school and junior college with a great part time job. And it, and it was a, a great supplement to my income and helped me not have any debt when I finished college as well. In other words, if you're drowning in student loan debt and if you're not making enough money, that's your fault. 
That's your fault. Don't expect the government or the very people you voted for to represent you to come to your rescue. Uh, there's something wrong with you and you need to take personal responsibility. Now, it's worth noting that, um, you know, some of the numbers are different today compared to when uh, the senator went to college. And I want to share those numbers with you right now. Um, it was in a tweet by Timothy Burke who pointed out that Roger Marshall's argument for not raising the minimum wage is that he had a minimum wage job and it paid for his entire college tuition. When he graduated from Kansas State University, tuition was $898 a year. It's now $10,000 a year. The minimum wage then was $3.35. It's now $7.25 and has been, by the way, since 2009. The federal government hasn't increased the federal minimum wage for years, since 2009. And so um, the more important takeaway, though, is that public colleges used to be free in this country. I know people think that it's a radical idea to ensure that public colleges uh, become free, but it's not radical when you consider that at one point in this country, they were free. So the shift uh, of risk was placed onto uh, working people. Uh, the government decided that they would no longer uh, subsidize these public uh, colleges and universities the way that they used to. And that led to um, rapidly increasing tuition prices, even in these state colleges. Now, Democrats are guilty of engaging in the personal responsibility nonsense as well. For example, in response to climate change, uh, liberal politicians would rather ban plastic bags or the use of plastic spoons than uh, ban fracking, for instance. And who can forget Forget President Joe Biden's tough love statements to financially anxious millennials. The younger generation now tells me how tough things are. Give me a break. <laughs> no, no. I have no empathy for it. Give me a break. Because here's the deal, guys. We decided we were going to change the world. And we did. We did. We finished the civil rights movement to the first stage. The women's movement came to the beam. So my message is, get involved. There's no place to hide. You can go out and you can make all the money in the world. And what we're seeing in government today and what we've been seeing in government for decades is uh, reflected in corporate culture as well. In the 1980s and 1990s, companies began to adopt a positive spin on personal responsibility, you know, like motivation, getting that grind on, making sure you hustle. You know, we've heard a lot of this lingo um, in mass media and American workers were losing their jobs as this positive spin was really starting to develop. They were losing their jobs in mass numbers and companies were shipping all sorts of jobs abroad in order to exploit cheap labor. Now, uh, Keep in mind that the uh, casualties of, you know, free trade agreements and dwindling bargaining power uh, were just told to suck it up. And if they were complaining, that ended up uh, hurting them uh, in, in being able to find another job. They were just told that they were being whiners, that they weren't taking per personal responsibility. And one of the best books to, to really dig into that issue is Bright Sided uh, by Barbara Ehrenreich, um, which also noted this, that between 1981 and 2003, about 30 million full-time American workers lost their jobs in corporate downsizing. American institutions, corporate and governmental, had little of concrete value to offer victims of this massive social dislocation. Unemployment benefits generally run out after six months. Health insurance ceases with employment. Many of the downsized white collar workers bounced back finding new jobs, although paying an average of 17% less than their former salaries. Ehrenreich realized that corporations increasingly turn to motivational coaches and this culture of toxic positivity uh, to convince workers that if they just take personal responsibility, if they change their attitude, stop complaining and improve themselves, they can live the American dream and enjoy economic stability. Is the change in the corporate culture in uh, the last 15 or so years as this positive thinking took over and began to replace more logical, analytical approaches to things.
focused on the bottom line. And the, uh, the idea had taken hold that we can do no wrong. Housing prices can never go down. The stock market can never go down. I, I did interview and got a lot of motivational speakers, and these are, you know, these are people who, their primary clients are corporate. Uh, they're brought into sales meetings, but also to any kind of general corporate meeting. And the message is again and again, you can have whatever you want so long as you focus your thoughts on it. You know, as long as you really, really, really want it. And I think that's nuts, frankly. I mean, uh, that's not how we make change in the world. You know, we make change by planning, by thinking, and by coming together. By planning, by thinking, by coming together, which is why we emphasize the need of strong labor and unions in America. Because without that, there's really no way to apply the necessary pressure to ensure that this culture changes, to ensure that the system changes, to ensure that uh, we're able to make decisions collectively about the kind of society we want to live in, uh, about the type of work environments we want to work in. And unfortunately, we don't have that right now. We used to, and there was a time in America where politicians did feel pressure to listen to organized labor. But now we find ourselves in these toxic work environments. We see the gap in inequality growing Every year, more and more, uh, every time there's some sort of disaster, including the coronavirus pandemic, uh, we see uh, inequality growing rapidly and the wealthier accumulating more and more wealth for themselves, while uh, the working class sees less and less of the wealth that they're building for these companies, that they're generating for these companies. And so... Erin Wright continues in her book, without a safety net, formerly middle-class people often tumbled quickly into low-wage jobs and even destitution. The once stable middle class of white-collar workers who had been brought up to believe that their skills and education would guarantee security was reduced to anxious scrambling. And that anxious scrambling continues. We're seeing it today. Uh, when the government, influenced by corporate interests, spends decades pushing for personal responsibility over things that unorganized workers actually have no control over, don't expect Washington to come to, the, come to your rescue. They're not. We're seeing that play out right now with the coronavirus relief bill. They might force businesses to shut down uh, and they might issue stay-at-home orders. But in the end, as millions of Americans get laid off, Democrats right now currently debate amongst themselves over whether or not they're willing to offer you a one-time coronavirus relief check. And Trump demonstrated how unpopular that is among voters. He showed that the messaging of personal responsibility is not an easy one to convince the American people of anymore. They've heard it for decades. Uh, they've experienced how it's pretty much complete and utter BS. And the only one who miraculously was smart enough to catch on to that happened to be Donald Trump, someone who's incredibly moronic in so many different areas. But when it comes to marketing, when it comes to understanding what fuels people, what, what drives people, he seems to have a better grip than the Democratic Party does. And there is a lot of pain and suffering to come for the Democratic Party if they continue regurgitating this line of personal responsibility, even as Americans deal with the absolute economic destruction of a rigged system that favors the rich uh, and brutalizes the poor. You know, your segment in watching Barbara Ehrenreich, who I deeply admire, is one of one of our best. Um, it reminded me of, I, I've been watching the Adam Curtis documentary series called Can't Get You Out of My Head, which just came out. And it's all about this. It's all about the the age of the individual, which is what we live in, right? And it was, you know, it used to be um, the age of the collective and mass politics. And, and, and starting at some point in the middle of the 20th century, that changed into the age of the, of the individual, which is what we're living in now, um, which has been coupled by so many things. I mean, like what you mentioned, these corporate um, initiatives to tell people that if they just, you know, if they just kind of do some little bit more self improvement, they're gonna they're gonna inherit the earth. Um, but what that's done is created a sense of anxiety in all of us because, right, like you know, if we just kind of did one more thing, if we just worked out a little harder, if we just read one more book, if we just 
meditated more, if we just, whatever, all these things, like if we just did a little bit more of all those things, we would be successful and we would be, and, and it just creates this sense of like anxiety that there is no, oh, totally. there, that, that you're the only person who is in charge of your own fate. I mean, every like Instagram girl has like, uh, you know, a meme on their page that's like, do whatever you want. It's all about you. Just if you just focus on yourself, like you don't have to listen. So it's, it's a hyper individual um, kind of mindset, which has become hegemonic. And it, really what it does is just makes us all anxious because, um, you know, Adam Curtis talks about, says a, a line that kind of resonated with me is that like going out into the woods at night with your friends is, can be exhilarating and thrilling. Going out into the woods at night by yourself is scary. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, that's a good, um, that's a good analogy. So, but we're not going to, we're not like, you know, we're, we're not going to go back. To, we can't like put individualism away. Um, we just have to create something new, some new form of like harnessing this individualism through to uh, some sort of collective thing. And it's going to be new, which is hard, which is why it's hard for us to imagine it. But um, yeah, that was, that was great. I mean, I very much enjoyed that segment and thank you also just a really really small comment uh, you know hearing trump's voice like it, it, i hadn't heard it in so long like i hadn't heard i hadn't seen or heard trump speak in so long i had forgotten it was just like a weird kind of like whoa uh you know he was so present in our lives <laughs> for years and now i know it's crazy yeah it was weird to hear yeah. his voice again the only other thing i'll say and then um i want to bring our guest on um you know because he's been waiting uh I, I th writing this segment made me realize what it is that I hate so much about the endless pressure to have a personal brand. Yeah. Like I, I hate those conversations. I hate like the question, what's your brand is yeah. gross and it should be irrelevant, but all of us has become our own little like marketing units, right? Like, we, like you not only have to be skilled and educated and like what, just to get a, a decently paying job in this economy, but you also have to go out of your way to advertise yourself. And yeah. every day publicly on social media, you gotta, you gotta share pictures of your personal life. You gotta tweet on a regular basis. Like it's, and it's so crazy because you're sharing so much of yourself out into the world, like publicly, but it's also very isolating. As you mentioned, you, you feel like that person going into the woods alone. Um, and you know, everything you do has to be thought of as like an investment in your, in your earning power. It's yeah. just, it's, it's gross. I hate all of it.